Uh, yeah. So, uh, today we're going to talk about addressing industry and labor. So we began this conversation about the New Deal uh, late last week. And is FDR trying to fix the economy? He's trying. I mean, he's, he's trying to give people jobs through relief. He's trying to fix current problems through recovery programs. He's trying to make sure it never happens again through reform. So his three R's, he's trying to tackle this Great Depression, and he's trying to fix most problems. Now again, he's not going to fix everything right away, but he is making a solid effort. So today we're going to start off with industry and labor. So how is FDR going to address industry and labor? So one of the first organizations he creates to address industry and labor is the NIRA, or the National Industrial Recovery Act, or NIRA. The National Industrial Recovery Act, or NIRA. Now, NIRA's job was to regulate the economy. Or at least it was intended to regulate the economy. Its purpose was to try to regulate the U.S. economy. Now, this is a debate that many economists and even politicians have. Should the U.S. government be actively intervening in the economy? Should we tell the economy what it should and should not do? Some people say yes, some people say no. The problem with the government going to the economy saying, you're good, you're bad, you can produce this much, you can't produce that much, they say that that's not efficient. What they argue was that when the government began to, again, regulate the U.S. economy through the NIRA, they said this was, again, an example of creeping socialism. They said it was an example of creeping socialism. But the question we have to ask is, what is the problem with socialism? And really, the easiest answer for what is the problem with socialism is that it's too much government. People would argue that socialism is too much government involvement, and that socialism is one step away from communism. That's really the biggest argument. The fear was that if America is becoming socialist, What's to stop it from keeping go, uh, to keep it from going in that leftward direction and making it communist? So they said that the NIRA and really the New Deal in general was an example of creeping socialism. That eventually, as FDR gets his way, we're going to become a socialist country, and eventually FDR will make us communists, and that's going to be terrible for a number of reasons. Now people ask, "Well, Mr. King, what's so bad about communism?" Well. I imagine you guys like picking your own shoes, picking your own food for dinner, whatever else, picking your own clothes, right? Under communism, that doesn't happen. Under communism, you know how you have a, maybe a nicer TV than maybe the guy down the street? Well, that's not fair. That's not equitable. So under communism, everyone would have the exact same TV because that's equal and fair. There would be no rich, there would be no poor. Everyone would have the exact same clothes, the exact same car. A doctor would get paid the exact same amount as someone that works at Burger King. Because the doctor is doing his part, the Burger King employee is doing their part, they're all contributing to society, and they are valued equally. Now, how many of you feel like maybe you sometimes work harder than people around you and you therefore deserve nicer things from time to time? I imagine everyone believes that. It's the human condition. And so, many people don't like the idea of communism because we're inherently greedy. And that's not a bad thing. I mean, as long as you control it, we're inherently self-interested. But many people argue that communism is not good. Because if you work hard, you don't get more things. You should just work as much as you're told, and that's it. So is anyone ever going to try? Is anyone ever going to work hard? Well, you do exactly what you're told, that's right. I guess some people like that. Others don't so much. The fear with the NIRA, again, it was, it was going to regulate the U.S. economy and it was creeping socialism. Here's what it did. It was designed to prevent extreme competition and overproduction. It was designed to prevent extreme competition and overproduction. Again, it was designed to prevent extreme competition and overproduction. Now, we know why overproduction is bad, because it drives down prices. Why is extreme competition bad? The 
trades with places? If, you, if Best Buy and I are competing, it also lowers prices. So it lowers prices for workers. And so if you think about it, folks, let's say McDonald's and Burger King were competing. 99 cent burgers, 89 cent burgers, 79 cent burgers, 39 cent burgers, 29 cent burgers, 19 cent burgers. Great for consumers, but for workers, does that mean their wages are going to become less and less and less? So that's going to be hard for the U.S. economy. So they wanted to prevent extreme competition and overproduction. Now, let me ask you. If those companies decide to compete, is that good for the consumer? It's good for us, right, if good prices are really low. And if one of those companies fail, shouldn't we let that company fail? I mean, if it wasn't strong enough to compete, doesn't that company you know, deserve to fail? And so in those cases, that's capitalism. You know, if, if we're going to help every company compete, well, that's not efficient. You know, it, should we let, you know, 900-year-old doctors go be doctors versus like the 50-year-old or 40-year-old guy who's really good at it? Well, you know, he's, he's trying really hard, so we should let him continue to be a doctor. No, free markets should suggest that he should stop being a doctor because that's not good. In any case, here's how they try to regulate the U.S. economy to prevent these things. Number one, they set maximum work hours. They set maximum work hours. How would that help the U.S. economy by setting maximum work hours? Saying that you are only allowed to work eight hours a day. Yeah, more jobs, right? Instead of you working maybe 16 hours, you can only work eight, which means how many people can we now hire? Two. So that's going to help the U.S. economy. Maximum work hours. Secondly, minimum wages. Minimum wages were established. So again, you had to get paid at least a certain amount. There was a minimum you had to be paid in order to work, or in order to, yeah, in order to work. So they had a minimum wage established. Again, the basic idea is they want to make sure that workers had a living wage. What is a living wage? Vanessa? Yeah. You make enough money to survive. So that's a living wage. You make enough money to survive. Now, when you think about it, uh, today the minimum wage today is supposed to be a living wage. But most states, folks, their minimum wage is not a living wage. In fact, you can't get by on a living wage, uh, minimum wage today in most states. The other problem is that a study was just released, I think, yesterday, that said that the minimum wage today in the U.S. is actually lower than the minimum wage in 1960. Now, yes, it's higher in terms of dollar amount, but with inflation, the purchasing power of minimum wage back in 1960 was much higher than minimum wage purchasing power today. Does that make sense? You could buy more, let's say, with $3 in 1960 than you can today with $6. Okay, maybe in 1960 you can buy you like milk and cereal. Today you can only just buy milk with $9. Does that make sense with everyone? That's the basic idea is that we actually have less purchasing power with our minimum wage today because our minimum wage is not a living wage. So that's something to keep in mind. Also, they set minimum prices. They set minimum prices. Why might they set minimum prices? Yes, yeah, so price level. They want to avoid competition. So they want to, again, set minimum prices. But again, if Best Buy wants to charge $100 for uh, an iMac, why should we stop it? If they're going to go out of business and they're being stupid, shouldn't we let them go out of business? If they don't know how to run a business, who are we going to say, oh, no, don't worry, we'll save you. Well, that's not capitalist. That's just the argument. And lastly, they set up production quotas and limits. They set up production quotas and limits. They set up production quotas and limits. Meaning, they would tell businesses how much to produce. Now again, so the federal government would be telling businesses how much to produce. Who should be telling businesses how much to produce? Consumers, right? If consumers want, let's say, a thousand iPads and businesses only produced 500, are they going to lose a lot of money and opportunity? Sure, that's their fault, and they go out of business. But if the government says, hey, produce uh, 1,200 iPads, might they overproduce? Will they still lose money? Yeah. And so again, the government is not in the business, or should not be in the business of telling businesses what to do. 
In any case, their goal was to regulate the economy, and it was well intended. But again, it's creeping socialism. It's too much government. Well, in any case, uh, the NIRA created the NRA as part of it. Not to be confused with today's NRA, the National Rifle Association. This is the National Recovery Administration. And the NRA's job was to enforce NIRA policies. The NRA's job was to enforce the NIRA policies and create public support. So again, it was designed to enforce NIRA policies and create public support. It's just like today. Uh, the president doesn't create laws, Congress does, but the president enforces them. The same thing here. NIRA created the policies, NRA enforced them. So again, uh, enforce NIRA policies and create public support. One of the ways that they would create public support was through the Blue Eagle program, or through Blue Eagle posters, if you're here. The basic idea is if that you were a company that was following the principles of NIRA to a T, you were doing everything exactly that you were told, maximum work hours, you were allowed to put this poster on your storefront. And what, how might that help you if you are allowed to put a Blue Eagle on your storefront? It would make them look good. And then would more people shop at your business? They're like, oh my gosh, you, you're doing your part. You're actually trying to help the U.S. economy. I'm going to shop at your store. So the NRA Blue Eagle actually helped some small businesses because they encouraged them for it to come. I mean, you guys, we do this all the time. They like organic coffee versus inorganic coffee. Or free trade coffee versus you know, non-free trade coffee. So you go like, oh, I'm going to shop at uh, that restaurant because they have organic chicken. I'm not going to shop at KFC. It's not organic. I don't know about that. That's I don't like you don't have that label. That's not organic. I'm going to shop at the organic restaurant. Which again, these are just labels. But again, does that attract more customers? People are more conscious and free thinking. Sure. So you have that. So this was well intended. It was supposed to recover the U.S. economy. And to some degree, it was helpful in the short run. It did help improve businesses in the short run. It did help draw attention. Unfortunately, The NRA and eventually the NARA is declared unconstitutional by the Schechter v. U.S. case, or the Schechter Poultry Corporation v. U.S. And in the Schechter case, it ruled Schechter case ruled that uh, you, uh, that the NRA is unconstitutional. At least that would happen. The NRA tried to regulate the Schechter Poultry Company. The NRA tried to regulate the Schechter Poultry Company, which was based in New York. And the problem was they were selling sick chickens. Question? Yeah, the NRA. The NRA, again, the NRA is kind of the enforcement of the NIRA, okay? So the NRA tried to regulate the Schechter Poultry Company because they were selling sick chickens, like chickens that were diseased. Now, should they be selling sick chickens to the people? Probably not. I mean, they're sick and then they're diseased, and so when you eat them, you might get sick too. But they were selling sick chickens, and so the NRA shut them down. Schechter sued. And the Supreme Court ruled, sorry, Schechter, or sorry, NRA, but you cannot regulate the Schechter Poultry Company because it violates what, or is not a part of what? Why can't the NRA regulate Schechter in the state of New York? Why can't the federal government regulate the Schechter Company that is based in the city or state of New York? and only based in the state of New York. Exactly. It comes up again. What they rule is that the federal government may not regulate intrastate commerce. That's really what it comes down to. Again, even though you're trying to fix the U.S. economy, you may not regulate intrastate commerce. Okay? If it was based in 
California and they were also selling stuff in Nevada, Utah, sure, fine, but they're not. And so the NRA cannot regulate intrastate commerce. Again, commerce within the state. This case is sometimes known as the sick chicken case. So it might come up as the sick chicken case as well, so just be familiar with that. FDR is not too happy about this, and so he will attack the Supreme Court later. He will get his revenge on the Supreme Court later. We'll talk about that in a bit. Questions there? None? Okay, sick chicken case. Oh, relief recovery or reform? The National Recovery Administration. Recovery, trying to fix current businesses, right? Yes. The NRA. Now remember, the NIRO, they created the policies, but the NRA is the one who actually enforced it. Okay, so that's like, you know, the Congress makes all the laws, but the President is the one who enforces it. So that's the same thing here. Or like, uh, Antonio, uh, Mayor Antonio Villarosa makes all the laws for Los Angeles, but the police are the ones who enforce it. They're like the police of the NIRA. Cool. Okay. National Labor Relations Board, NLRB, is next. What well, NLRB? Also known as the Wagner Act, uh, created by Senator Robert Wagner, hence the name Wagner Act. So, uh, the Wagner Act did two things. Number one, it recognized labor unions' right to collectively bargain. It recognized labor unions' right to collectively bargain and strike. Now again, collectively bargain means what? What does that mean? You guys should know. You guys are going to get jobs in the future. And you want to know if you have the right to collectively bargain or not. But who? For who? Just for me? All the workers. I'll give you an example. Uh, every year, do I have to go talk to Ms. Mom and okay, I think I worked really hard this year, so I deserve a raise. Do I have to do that? Actually, you guys may not know. No, I don't. I don't have to ask for a raise every year. I automatically get one. Because the union collectively bargained for all teachers in the district that says, if you work here, this is your first salary. After two years, this is how much you get paid. After three years, this much. After four years, this much. Does that make sense for everyone? If you have just a bachelor's degree, you get this. If you have a master's, you get this. If you have two masters, you get this. So it's true for every single worker across the entire school district. Does that make sense? The idea is that everyone's supposed to benefit from collective bargaining. Because might there be some shy teachers that may not be very good at bargaining for themselves? They're like, uh, can I get a raise this year? No. Okay, fine. You just leave. Whereas we're like, ah, uh, no, I'm not leaving until I get a raise. Because I work really hard. No, no, no. I stole the key. You can't get out. Okay, so the basic idea is that there are some who would benefit and others that would not. But the problem is, that one poor teacher, if that poor teacher gets fired, is there anyone to protect that person? No. Or if that person doesn't get a raise, there's no one to protect that person. Now, is it possible that every teacher might one day be in that position where they don't get a raise that they deserve? Sure. And so instead of having each individual employee ask for a raise one at a time, which is actually the situation for the majority of you who will enter the workforce, you'll have like a review and they'll tell you if you get a raise or not. We, as a collectively bargained group, will get a raise automatically. And that's collective bargaining. Because another way to look at it is an attack on one is an attack on all. A raise for one is a raise for all. Does that make sense for everyone? That's collective bargaining. That's why there's benefits to it. They also argued uh, that the major reason, or they blamed businesses for poor labor conditions. They blamed businesses for poor labor conditions, and therefore they blamed businesses for causing what? Strikes. They said, it's your fault 
So they blamed businesses for poor working conditions, and therefore they blamed businesses for strikes. It's your fault. We're the one causing poor working conditions. If you know we had air conditioning, things would be better. We wouldn't be so angry. But it's your fault. So good stuff so far. They also uh, banned the yellow dog contracts, which, by the way, it's very hard to find a cartoon of yellow dog contracts. So here's a picture of a yellow dog signing a contract. So yellow dog contracts. Again, what's a yellow dog contract? Uh, agreement not to not strike. An agreement not to join a union. Agreement. So close. Agreement not to join a union. So again, pretty good, right? Again, enforcing, strengthening unions, that kind of thing. Relief, recovery, or reform? Are we uh, fixing current problems, making things better for the future? Are we giving money directly to the workers? This is more a system of reform, guys, because what we're doing is we're trying to prevent strikes from the future, banning yellow dog contracts. We're not really fixing business now. We're just trying to make sure it never happens again. The other thing that was created is the FLSA. 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 FLSA did a few things. Number one, it established a minimum wage and a 40-hour week. It established a minimum wage and a 40-hour week for interstate industries. And again, it established a minimum wage and a 40-hour week for interstate industries. So any businesses or industries that what? Cross. Cross state lines. So give me an example today. Uh, FedEx. FedEx, UPS. Uh, people said McDonald's. I said kind of. McDonald's is kind of interstate commerce. Here's why. Each individual McDonald's franchise is independently owned. So the McDonald's, let's say here, what, uh, Hacienda? That's independently owned. But the McDonald's corporation that sells those franchises, the McDonald's corporation that might uh, trade those things back and forth or ship you know, goods back and forth, that is interstate commerce. So it just depends. If you have, a, like for example, McDonald's corporation is interstate commerce. In and out is also interstate commerce, but just recently because it opened in and out in like Nevada. But if it didn't open uh, in, in and out in Nevada, it would be still intrastate commerce because it only operated in the state of California. So that's first, minimum wage and 40 hour work week. Secondly, and finally, this happens, they ban what, finally? Maybe that already. Fair labor. What do they ban? No special shops. Well, those are bad already, but still have them. They ban child labor under 16. They ban child labor under 16. <coughs> it's pretty good. They ban child labor under 16 and dangerous work under 18. So from 16 to 18, you can work, but you can't just work in dangerous work. So banned dangerous work under 18. So again, when I was 16, I worked. I tutored uh, for a company for two years before I graduated from college, or high school anyway. Uh, and, uh, but I couldn't work in a coal mine from 16 to 18 because dangerous work. But again, that's weird for us to say in California, but if you're working in like West Virginia where there are coal mines and you might grow up in a mining town, I mean, you might want to work in a coal mine where that's where the real money is, but you can't because that's dangerous work. So from 16 to 18, maybe you can do like the secretarial work or maybe like the office work for a coal mine, but you won't actually be able to work in the coal mine until you're 18. But again, we don't feel like kids have the ability to uh, make these decisions because they're stupid. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> kids are just dumb. But yeah, Fair Labor Standards Act, reform, right? Again, major changes, major reform. So Fair Labor Standards Act, reform. Cool. The TVA is next, the Tennessee Valley Authority. I think I'm doing all those acronyms. Fun stuff, huh? The TVA, yes, there are a lot, alphabet soup. There are tons, because again, FDR, is he just doing whatever, trying everything? That's pretty much what's happening here. Let's do that. That sounds like a good idea. Uh, Mr. President, I heard that. whatever, let's do it. Sounds like a good idea. You had me at Mr. President. Go get funding for that administration. Tennessee Valley Authority. This is a unique program. And actually, this is the one criticized for being the most socialistic program. 
This is the program that's criticized for being the most socialistic of all of them. The most socialistic. Let me explain what happened with this program argued to be the most socialistic. The Tennessee Valley Authority uh, was designed to modernize the Tennessee Valley. It was intended to modernize the Tennessee Valley. If you look at this photo, folks, the Tennessee Valley was very backwards at the time. I mean, we're already, what, in the 1930s? And yet parts of Tennessee Valley were still in, like, in the 1880s. No running water, no electricity, farms were struggling, not very good soil. I mean, they were very backwards. And so we decided, you know, we need to improve this region because it'll be good. And so the goals for the TVA were the following. Here's what they wanted to do. Number one, again, they wanted to uh, create jobs in the region. So the goal was to create jobs. Number two, they wanted to create cheap electricity. They wanted to create cheap electricity. Three, they wanted to restore the soil because they couldn't really grow anything. So they wanted to restore the soil. And four, they wanted to stop private utility monopolies. They wanted to stop private utility monopolies. What's a utility? Or a private utility? Gas, water, electricity, all stuff. that's all utilities. Telephone, those are all utilities. Pretty much up until this point, folks, the utility companies had a monopoly on all your electricity. Now, the government did not regulate it at all. Today, folks, uh, is there a monopoly on electricity? Here, let's say, for example, La Ponte, do you have a choice about who to buy your electricity from? No. You guys can only buy your electricity from one company, Southern California Edison. There isn't like, you know, five people that are willing to sell you electricity. We just, it's just not feasible. It's not worth it. Uh, so we do have electrical monopolies today, utility monopolies today, but they're government regulated. So they can't charge you whatever they want. Whereas back then, you did have utility monopolies and they could charge you whatever they wanted because no one else was selling electricity. So it's just like railroads, right? Oh, I'm sorry, you want to power the radio in your house? Well, that's going to be $100 a month. Oh, you know, the other electrical company? Okay, good luck with that because they're not around. There's no one here but me. So the government wanted to tackle that. So the way the government does it is the government goes here and for reforesting. And again, did the uh, restoring of the soil help? If you look, here's them not restored, and here's the soil restored. And they actually did these as a comparison. Look at how much good work we're doing versus this. And we are helping. But one of the major things the federal government did to kind of create all these jobs, bring them cheap electricity, fight the monopolies, whatever else, was they built hydroelectric dams. They built hydroelectric dams in the Tennessee Valley. They built hydroelectric dams. Which means what's going to generate that electricity? Water, right? As the water flushes through, it's going to turn a turbine and then to create electricity. In any case, the hydroelectric dam was going to create electricity. Well, a few good things. Again, will this create jobs? Sure. And again, will it create cheap electricity? Sure. Now the question is, how is it going to fight monopolies? Here's what it did. The government competed with private utility companies to sell electricity. The government began to compete with private utilities to sell electricity. And people argued that that element was far too socialistic. That was too much socialism. That the government competed with private utilities to sell electricity. Because folks, let me ask you this. Is a company allowed to lose money? If it loses too much money, though, what's going to happen? If a company loses too much money, what's going to happen? 
we're out of business. So let's say it costs electrical company, I don't know, $100 to produce electricity, but the government's selling it for 80, so they're selling it for 80. Is that company eventually gonna go out of business? Sure, it can't compete. Whereas the US government, the US government is actually allowed to lose money. In fact, it loses money all the time. Because let's say that we want to sell electricity. It costs $100, but we want to make it cheap, so we sell it for, let's say, $40. Now, we're losing $60 per, I don't know, unit or whatever, or per month. But we feel that, you know what, that's okay. We can do that because we're going to borrow money. Now, the question is, who are we going to borrow money from to pay for these electrical costs today? Not banks. Banks are going to loan us money for that. We don't have to borrow from the banks either. You guys we're going to borrow from? We're going to borrow it from the future. Because I'm going to rack up a massive debt today. But who's going to pay it off? My grandchildren. That's the basic idea. The federal government is in a unique situation. Actually, all governments are in a unique situation where they can owe money. They can actually lose money day after day after day because the government is not going to go out of business. The government will always be there. And so what's going to happen is the federal government will lose all this money and then they'll have you know, your grandchildren paid off in the future, which is why taxes will be so high in the future. But that's okay because it'll be their problem, not ours. But in any case, that's the basic idea. <clears throat> so many businesses said that's not fair. The federal government can charge whatever it wants because it's not worried about profit. It's not worried about losing money. It's not worried about costs. So many people accuse this of being, again, pretty uncapitalistic. It's not laissez-faire. It's not free market. It's too much socialism. It's, again, creeping socialism. But think about it today, folks. If the U.S. government began selling cars, who would lose out in that business? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you might lose out Ford, Chrysler, Toyota, Honda, and eventually once all those businesses go out, who's going to be the only company making cars? The U.S. government. And again, the U.S. government is not going to invest on new styles. They're not going to invest on new techniques because they don't care. If there's only one place to buy stuff from, they're going to okay, we're going to make one car and only one model. And if you want it, you buy it and it only comes in gray. That's it. We're not going to get all fancy. We don't need red cars and blue cars and white cars. No, just gray. It's the cheapest color. And that's how it's going to be. Okay? All right. And that's what happens. And so again, this is the fear that the government is getting too involved. And that's what they do in the TVA. Here's again a cartoon suggesting that the federal government is going to swallow up private industry. But if the federal government starts with utilities, might it start also expanding in food? Might it start expanding in railroads or banks or technology? That's the fear. Because so if the federal government starts competing in the market now, it's going to challenge businesses in other industries later. So their fear is that government might be getting too big. That's too much socialism again. TDA, relief, recovery, or reform. It's a lot of stuff. It's not necessarily, well, I guess it is reform. Uh, it's relief, recovery, and reform. It's actually out the way. Because are we helping the people directly? Sure. Uh, are we helping to recover the Tennessee Valley with farming or whatever else? Sure. And are we kind of changing the role of the government uh, with regard to industries or you know, utilities? The answer is yes. Then there's housing reform. First you have FHA, Federal Housing Administration, which still exists today. The FHA provided loans to buy new homes or renovate old ones. So the FHA provided loans to buy new homes or renovate old ones. And how is that going to help the U.S. economy? What industry is going to benefit from FHA loans? Real estate, construction, again, Loans to buy new homes or renovate old ones. You still have to hire, you know, construction workers to fix your new home or your old home. <coughs> then you have the United States Housing Authority, the USHA. And the US Housing Authority, what they do is they begin to build low income housing in the cities. They begin to build low-income housing in the cities. 
to this day, then you might know some of these uh, as projects, like the projects in like LA or projects in New York. These are government housing. The idea is that if you don't make very much money, uh, a landlord will charge you a lot of money to pay for the rent, right? Because they care about making a profit. The government doesn't so much. So the government will build housing where it can charge you less than the market price just so that you can live there. So the idea is to get to help those in need. Relief recovery reform? Relief and a little bit of recovery because it's going to try to help the housing industry as well. So relief and recovery for this one. Again, uh, provided money to build low-income housing in cities. To build low-income housing in the cities. So FHA, USHA, and the SSA. This one affects you today, directly. Social Security Act. Social Security Act today is probably the most, one of the most complicated laws in America. It's one of the most controversial as well. Everyone loves it, no one knows how to pay for it. That's one of our biggest problems. Everyone loves it, no one knows how to pay for it. Here's what it did, and then we'll talk about the problems with it and how it affects you. Number one, it provided federal and state unemployment insurance. It provided federal and state unemployment insurance. So if you are unemployed, how will the federal government help you? What will it do? If you're unemployed, they'll give you money until you find another job. Now, it's not like you can do that for like 30 years. Okay, but it'll give you some money until you can find your next job. So again, federal and state unemployment insurance is what they'll provide you. The next thing they'll offer, old age retirement payments. Old age retirement payments. So that when you're old, you have to keep working. Now, I mean, if you're 65 years old, guys, should you still be working and trying to make sure you pay your mortgage? No, you should be allowed to retire. You shouldn't have to work until you die. That sucks. And so the basic idea was Social Security was designed to help families, you know, be able to retire early. So it's old age retirement payments. Also, it was designed to help dependent or mothers with children. It was designed to help mothers with children. Dependent mothers with children, but mothers with children. Or just mothers, because I guess it's redundant to say with children. Which is mothers without children. Think about that. Also help the blind, handicapped, or orphaned. It was designed also to help the blind, handicapped, or orphaned. So again, uh, all of this was going to be paid through a payroll tax. All of this is going to be paid through a payroll tax. So if you, any of you guys work, you will see Social Security tax, and it gets taken out of your Social Security uh, pay. It, takes, it gets taken out of your paycheck every month or every two weeks, whatever you get paid. Um, and so here's a problem for you guys today. Again, paid through a payroll tax. Here's a problem for you guys today. Um, Social Security right now is uh, paying for my parents when they retire. It'll likely be there uh, to pay for me when I retire. And again, when you guys start working, you'll be paying this tax. I'm currently paying this tax every year. My parents paid that tax. By the time you guys retire, it's likely that there will be no money left for your generation because we're spending more money than we're taking in. And no one wants to touch Social Security because it's so controversial. No one, everyone feels like if you touch Social Security, then you're not going to get reelected because it's such a controversial issue because everyone likes Social Security, but no one knows how to pay for it. Increasing taxes will make you unpopular. Reducing Social Security benefits will make you unpopular. No one knows what to do with it. And so the problem is that likely, by the time you guys retire, there will be nothing left. But here's the problem. You're still going to pay for it. That's the problem. You're still going to pay for Social Security, even though by the time you retire, you're going to have nothing. And so Social Security needs to be fixed before then. It's possible that it will become uh, solvent before I retire, even. It's possible there will be nothing left by the time I retire. So that's also a problem. So how do you fix it? My answer is I really don't know. Most people don't know how to fix it. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, that's why you have a social security number, because when you work, uh, your money goes toward a social security account. So again, the more you work, like for example, when I retire, I'll get more money than someone who's worked at Starbucks their entire life. Because I contributed more to social security than someone who works, like again, let's say I make uh, $100,000 a year, but someone who's making $10,000 a year, my social security check will be more because I put more into it because it's a percentage of what you make. Because if you look at that list of what we're paying for, uh, actually the biggest problem is people are living longer than we anticipated. Honestly, that's one of the biggest problems. People are living longer. And so before, when you retire, you expect to live maybe to, what, 75? And that's pretty good, right? 75, 80. Now people live at 95, 98. And that's like, everyone's like, oh, 100. Now no one's celebrating because 100's like, yeah, that makes sense. Like today with healthcare and everything else, it's one of the biggest problems is old age. People are living longer than we anticipated. That's a huge, I mean, the average is what? 30 years more than it used to be back when this was passed. 1930s average age is what? 69, 72? Nowadays, it's like 88. Now imagine all those extra people who have to pay for all those extra 10 years. That's 10 years that you don't get. And people are always getting older. And yet, people are dying. And I'm not saying people should die, but the problem is that our system is currently unable to support that all. So it's a problem. And again, do I know how to fix it? Not really, because it's, most people that are social security experts don't know how to fix it. Because it's so complicated. And it's so controversial that no one really wants to touch social security, even though everyone wants to fix it. Because we all like it, we don't know how to fix it. We all like it, but no one wants to touch it. We all like it, but we want to pay for it. It's a problem. Because everyone benefits from social security. But no one wants to pay for the benefits that we get. So do we lower the benefits? Do we change the policies? Do we make Social Security retirement 70 now or 80? Because people are living longer now. Do you want to work till you're 70? I don't want to work till I'm like, I don't want to work till 60. I mean, I'll be honest. I want to retire by the time I work till like 60 years old. So, I don't know. It's crazy. Real life. It's hard. Anyway, again, you know, dependent mothers will get uh, Social Security. Uh, and then old people get social security, so that's the basic idea, people benefit. Uh, relief recovery reform for social security, guys. Reform, it's a big change. Reform, you get money if you're unemployed, you get money if you're retired, you get money. It's pretty good. What is the Indian Reorganization Act, the IRA? Remember the Indians, Native Americans, remember that, remember those guys? Uh, we, uh, we told them all these things, and then we just laughed and laughed, because like we weren't intending to keep any of those promises. Well, FDR was like, yeah, you know what? That sucked, man. I'm sorry for all of that. So in 1934, FDR passes the Indian Reorganization Act, which uh, repeals the Dawes Severalty Act. Remember the Dawes Severalty Act of 1887? It repeals it. It repeals the Dawes Severalty Act of 1887. Who remember what the Dawes Severalty Act did? Anyone? Carla. And it took away? Uh, sort of. Property, sort of, but you have to be specific about it. How did it take away their property? Mary? It made them stop sharing their land. Remember, it took away tribal ownership. So the Dawes Severalty Act was repealed, which means they restored tribal ownership of land. Yay! It's back. So they restored tribal ownership of land. It's cool. They recognized tribal governments. So they restored tribal ownership. They recognized tribal governments, and they provided loans to tribes for economic development. Loans to tribes for economic development. That'll make up for like 300 years of lies and deceit and taking of your land, right? That'll make up for losing everything. Okay, right, that's, that's good. That's that in terms of any removal act, uh, any, remo any reorganization act. See, similar things. 
in the Reorganization Act, Relief, Recovery, or Reform. It's a lot of it. This is a little bit of everything. Relief, Recovery, and Reform. I mean, we provided them money. We tried to restore their uh, culture and their uh, government industries. And we tried to make sure we wouldn't take it away again. So it's all three, Relief, Recovery, and Reform. So, effects of the New Deal. That's pretty much just like restoring the old land. It's like the CCC comes in and tries to make things farmable again. In any case, uh, the effects of the New Deal. Well, you tell me if it worked. The GMP increased by almost $20 billion. From $74.2 billion to $91.4 billion. So, GMP measures what again? Which means what? What does that measure? Gross national product. What does that measure? Yeah, total amount that your country produces, right? So the gross national product measured how much our country produced. Which means, did we produce more uh, through the FDR administration? Yeah, we produced $20 billion more that year. So that's pretty good. Wages increased by 50% on average. It went from $16.73 to $20.13. Now again, that's average wage. That's not minimum wage. If that was minimum wage, that would be amazing. But no, that's like, you know, including doctors, teachers, whatever. What was the average wage at the time? $20.13. It went up by almost $4. That's pretty good. Unemployment dropped by 5%, which means 3 million people were less unemployed. Well, 3 million people less were unemployed. Not they were less unemployed. But again, what? The emphasis on words makes a difference. They were 3 million less unemployed, or 3 million less unemployed. They weren't as unemployed as they were previously. So it makes a difference how you say it. In any case, in your assessment so far, is the New Deal working? Yeah, look, the economy is getting better, you know, GMP has increased, wages are getting better, there's less people unemployed. I mean, this seems to be working so far. So, uh, good job, FDR. Apparently, your programs are working out for everyone. So he went for re-election in 1936, and people saw the numbers, and what did they think? Let's keep going, right? Let's keep charging forward. I mean, FDR, first four years, you increase the economy by 20 billion, you increase wages by 50 percent, three million people are uh, not un unemployed anymore. It's pretty good. So uh, yeah, we'll give you almost all of the electoral votes. I will give eight to that guy, but you had the other 523. 523 to eight guys. You won 61 percent of the popular vote. Holy crap! That's a lot. 61% of the popular vote. You could pretty much do whatever you want with 61% of the popular vote. But it's a huge majority. So he wins. And the New Deal won't come to an end. And he says, hey, the economy is doing better. The economy is doing great. I mean, who am I to uh, stop the economy from greatness? I mean, if you look at those numbers, would you argue that maybe the economy is recovered? With all those increases? Like, he's not the same way. Wow, the economy is recovered. So maybe it's time to end this new deal. Maybe it's time to go back to the way things were. To come back to the glory of America without so much government. Well, uh, he did. And he said, well, look, uh, unemployment was really bad. And it got okay for a while. And then uh, unemployment dropped in the 1920s. And it went back up. And it went back down. And then the stock market crashed. And look how much unemployment went. An unemployment increase after the stock market crash. Sure. And then FDR's New Deal came in. It was like, ah, oh, sweet. So look, the unemployment is declining. Here's where he comes to power. Oh, okay, all right. The unemployment you know, is going down. And look at how he said that he you know, gave all the people jobs. And then afterwards, look what happened. Unemployment went right back up after he was elected, re-elected. What happened was that there was a recession in 1937. So right after his first four years in office, there was a recession. You have a double dip recession. Where it drops once, all the way down, then it gets good again. And it drops all the way down again. So again, you have this double dip recession. And what happened, was that FDR believed that the economy was strong. He thought that the economy had recovered. FDR believed the economy had recovered. And so, if the economy is good, 
well, what should it be playing such a large role anymore? The government. So he said, you know what? The economy is good. The economy is recovered. He began to roll back his New Deal programs. Because he believed that the economy had recovered, and I would argue also, wow, the economy's doing pretty well, he began to, reco or began to roll back his New Deal programs. And the expectation is who is supposed to step in to fill that void now that the government has stepped back. Industries, businesses. So the expectation was businesses and industry were supposed to step in. Once FDR rolled back the New Deal programs, private industry was supposed to step in. And all those jobs that we created, who was supposed to hire all those people now? Private industries. Well, guess what? That didn't happen. Again, unemployment was this bad, but FDR got it to this point. Look how low he got it. He did pretty well. And then, after that recession, look how bad he got again. It just got horrible. Eventually, it goes all the way down. But it's not because of FDR. Or it's not because of the New Deal. What gets unemployment down to almost zero by 1942? We're going to fight a war, guys. And so are we going to need people to make guns, tanks, bullets, machine guns, planes? Yeah. We're going to hire everyone to do that. That's going to save us from the Depression, not the New Deal. And if you look, here's when FDR takes office. Industrial production gets pretty good. And you actually look how much he does in terms of recovering the U.S. economy. Because here's what the U.S. economy was producing before, and here's what it was uh, at the peak of his election in 1937. And when he cuts all those New Deal programs, and look how far it drops. So it's, okay, it's a problem. It was a mistake. It was a huge mistake. We call it the mistake of 1937 by cutting those New Deal programs. It's a problem. And so there are criticisms of the New Deal. Hmm, people don't really like what FDR was doing here, so let's talk about the criticisms of the New Deal. Again, here's America sick, and FDR is offering his New Deal remedies, FHA, CCC, AAA, NRA, NIRA. And here, take all this medicine. Just take all of it. Cocktail. Drink everything. Should be fine. So, the first group that opposed FDR was a group called the American Liberty League. The American Liberty League was made up of conservatives who believed that the New Deal was creeping socialism. They accused the New Deal of creeping socialism. They also said that the New Deal was too much government. Too much government involvement. What did they want? They want laissez-faire. If businesses are going to fail, let them fail. Because will others eventually step in and recover? Sure. But they believe we're playing the long game. But again, they believed that government was too big or too involved. They also believed that the New Deal was anti-business. They believed that the New Deal was anti-business, that it was actually killing jobs, not creating them. They also believed that the New Deal was wasteful. Wasteful. With them so far? They just don't like it. These are mostly Republicans. Mostly Republicans. There were other critics. Father Charles Coughlin and Senator Huey Long. Father Charles Coughlin felt that the New Deal did not go far enough. Actually, they both felt that the New Deal did not go far enough. Father Charles Coughlin uh, had a radio program with 40 million people listening every week. So, Father Charles Coughlin had a radio program with 40 million listeners. I'm not a mathematician, but I would assume that's a lot. 40 million people listening to you on the radio every week. And he said that, again, the New Deal did not go far enough. He said that uh, FDR should have 
nationalized the banks. He accused FDR of being a liar for not nationalizing the banks. He said FDR should have nationalized the banks. What does it mean to nationalize something, nationalize an industry? No, that's a good guess. To nationalize an industry means to take it over. He believed that FDR should have taken over the banks. Not just release the strong ones, but actually physically take them over and say there's no more private banks in America, the government controls all the banks. That's what he wanted FDR to do, to control the banks. And he called FDR a liar for not doing it. He said, you told us in the banking hall that you were going to fix society. And instead, you just let the strong ones succeed and don't be just as corrupt as before. You lied to us, FDR. So again, he said the New Deal did not go far enough. He wished that FDR was more socialistic. He wanted more socialist programs. Eventually, they take him off the air, though. Uh, take him off the radio because he starts saying some really racist things like Jews are bad and they deserve to die and Jews are this problem with America and black people this and black people that. So we're like, uh, never mind. This guy's kind of not good for radio. So we take him off. But up until that point, he was like, people were following him. People believed that, you know, he had a good point and they were angry at FDR. Not because he wasn't, uh, you know, not because he wasn't doing anything. It's that he wasn't doing enough. Uh, Father, uh, then the Senator Huey Long, Senator Huey Long had another program, also believed that the F, that New Deal was not, did not go far enough. Uh, he had a program that he wanted called Share Our Wealth Program. He wanted to promote a Share Our Wealth Program. Sometimes known as Every Man is a King. Uh, and the basic idea was he wanted to give $5,000 in our Share Our Wealth Program in the Share Our Wealth program, Senator Huey Long wanted to give $5,000 to every family. And that money was going to come from taxes on the rich. It's a pretty good program, I guess. Again, $5,000 for every family. Again, unrealistic because that's $5,000 that we don't have that we're going to give to just random people. Um, again, but he wanted to make it every man a king or whatever else, but that didn't pan out. He eventually becomes this dictatorial governor of Louisiana, and he like he disbands the government, and he just like rules it with an iron fist. So he's eventually assassinated. So they kill him because he's too much of a dictator in Louisiana. Not the government, like just random people. His enemies kill him. And uh, if he didn't die, he probably would have run against FDR as a Democratic candidate. But yeah, two guys that just felt that we did not go far enough. Then there's Dr. Francis Townsend. And again, he wanted old age retirement payments. He wanted old age retirement payments. He felt that the elderly should be paid $200 a month, which is, by the way, double the average salary of Americans at that time. He felt the elderly should be paid $200 a month in this old age retirement payment. He would give old people $200 a month. Uh, this obviously fails, but if they estimated this would cost half of the entire U.S. budget just to pay for this plan. Which is not ridiculous since that's pretty much what Social Security is today. It's like 45 to like 50% of the U.S. budget today. But he kind of got what he wanted with Social Security. But again, he advocated for the elderly. FDR, he said that FDR wasn't doing enough for the old. So FDR was like, okay, fine, Social Security. So there's that. I told you how FDR was mad at the Supreme Court. So one thing that FDR does to try to uh, get back at the Supreme Court for the Schechter case is that he tries to pass, though fails, to pass the Judiciary Reorganization Bill, which is supposed to do two things. Number one, he wanted to force justices over 70 to retire. He wanted to force justices over 70 to retire. Now, 
Uh, how long are justices allowed to serve according to the U.S. Constitution? For life. So they're allowed to die in office if they want to. Or they can retire when they want. But again, the FBI says, no, 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 you're going to retire, you old curmudgeon bastards. You never like what I want with the New Deal anyway. You just have these old philosophies. So what we're going to do is when you're 70, you're done. We try to pass that law. And that's, I think it was six of the justices, six of the nine justices were over 70. So his hope was that now we would force them to retire and that way he would get what he wanted. If that didn't work, he also had something called the court packing scheme in which he would just double the size of the Supreme Court. Well, if I, the justices currently don't like it, I'm going to double the size of the Supreme Court. I'm going to add you know, eight more people to the Supreme Court. And who gets to appoint those new Supreme Court justices? FDR does, which means will that give him the majority? Yes, it will. So FDR also tried the court packing scheme, which meant that he would just double the size of the Supreme Court so that he could appoint the new justices. So you see him trying to circumvent the Constitution and just do whatever he wants? This is a big criticism of him. By the way, both things he's trying to do, totally unconstitutional. But they don't pass because they're unconstitutional. So they both fail. But again, you can see the mindset FDR had. Just let me do what I want. Trying to make the country better. This is a really good way to describe how people viewed FDR from time to time. He was going to reorganize the government. Then he was going to get the Supreme Court to do whatever he wanted, and eventually he would become a dictator. Pretty amazing stuff. That was kind of the plan. So here's the question then. I mean, looking at the recession and the critics, was the New Deal a failure? It depends on who you talk to. But let's look at the data. Many argue that the government got too big. It's got way, way too big. Number two. You could argue that states became weaker and government became stronger. So states were no longer as powerful, and some people don't like that. And some people don't trust Washington. They trust California. They trust Nevada. They trust North Carolina. But they don't trust Washington, D.C. They don't like some random guy in like Texas telling us what to do or some random guy in D.C. telling us what to do. The national debt doubled. And people are going to ask, for what? I mean, did we keep those jobs that we uh, hired? No, so we spent and doubled the national debt. And now, what do we get out of it? We will say nothing. Was it worth it? Some people say no. Look, 19.5 billion to 40 billion. For what? We became a handout state. What does that mean? We just gave money to people, and the argument is that what? It creates laziness. laziness. People are becoming lazy now. No, oh, don't do work. Don't worry, we'll give you money. We'll take care of you. So fine, we become lazy. They so said us becoming a handout state made people not want to look for work. It made people complacent and lazy. The biggest argument, of course, was creeping socialism, that we were one step away from what? Communism. His court packing scheme got him in a lot of trouble. The fact that he had a dummy Congress, where must Congress do whatever he wanted, right? So hey, pass this, Congress is like, okay. Because are you going to oppose a president that has 61% of the popular vote? It's going to be really hard to. So there was accusation that FDR was a dictator at this time. Who can blame you? Seemed like one. There are millions still unemployed, and yet you wonder, so where the heck did that money come from? And really the key thing you guys should always mention is that all those jobs that FDR created, the question is, were they sustainable jobs? Were those jobs sustainable? I mean, what those jobs initially, right? Guy painting the curb, guy painting the picture of the guy who's painting the curb, guy painting, you know, like taking a picture of that. But is that sustainable? Is that gonna, are those people going to have jobs you know, for the next 10 years just doing that same thing? And that's the problem, is that, yes, he created jobs, but most of the jobs were temporary. They were not sustainable. So that's something you have to keep in mind, is that they were unemployed because he wasn't really creating sustainable jobs. So many argue that it was wasteful spending. We spent $20 billion dollars People are still unemployed, so what the hell did we just spend all our money on? Well, why do we do this? And lastly, it failed to fix.
fix the depression. Because at the end of the New Deal, folks, was the depression fixed? No, they got back to exactly where it was when he took office. He failed to fix the depression. At least his critics would argue that he failed to fix the depression. Good so far? Well, now, most people will tell you that FDR did fix the Great Depression. That's probably not the case. There you go. Now, there is some good things about the New Deal, though, that we should not forget. Number one, when we talk about the support of the New Deal, well, it did prevent the economy's collapse until World War II. That's like if you get in a horrible, horrible car crash, and I get to you first. So I wrap my, you know, my jacket around your arm so you don't bleed to death. Did I fix your bloody, broken arm? No, I did not. However, did I prevent you from dying until you got to the doctor's office? Yes, I did. So you're welcome. That's pretty much the argument. FDR may not have fixed the, maybe he didn't fix the Great Depression, but he did keep the economy from collapsing until World War II could fix it. Make sense? That's the basic idea. And that FDR was the glue that held the country together until we could bring in the nails and new the support beams to kind of fix it. What was that? Number two, he helped prevent hunger. Well, not hunger, but he helped prevent starvation. People were hungry. But he did prevent starvation for the most part. So a lot of people were going to starve to death without FDR. So he made sure that that didn't happen. Also, he did try to distribute national income by you know, creating more jobs. He did try to create more jobs, distribute the national income, make things more equal, equitable. So this is retain self-respect. You know, many people were allowed to work instead of just get money from the federal government. So people felt like they were contributing, still working to provide for their families instead of just saying, I have no money, I have to go live in a, in a homeless shelter, maybe go to the soup kitchen. People got to retain their self-respect because they got to work. So that's a big deal. My favorite is a lion. That's the best one. FDR saved our economy from socialism. A lot of people say, oh, creeping socialism. Other people will say, actually, he prevented us from becoming socialist. If our economy collapsed, is it possible that the lower classes might have risen up and taken over the society? Say, oh, all the rich people are responsible, so only the poor people should now be in charge. Communism. FDR prevented that, his supporters would argue. He prevented us from becoming socialist. He prevented us from being anti-business. He actually worked with business. He said, I gave money to businesses all the time. I helped. You can't accuse me of being socialist. You can't accuse me of being anti-business. I prevented socialism. The things could have been much worse without me. He cured capitalism of its abuses. You know all those people who are being corrupt on the stock market? All those people doing bad things in the housing market, we got rid of those people. So we made reforms. We made our economy better. We got rid of the abuses. The labor seems to like him. And lastly, FDR took a middle of the road approach. What I mean by this is that he wasn't a radical or conservative. He was willing to take on all ideas. Um, you could argue that, again, the quote we like is that his programs were not radical. They were evolution, not revolution. They were evolution, not revolution. What does that mean, evolution, not revolution? What is the difference between evolution and revolution? You know? What happens by itself? Whereas? Sort of. 
mean, that, I mean, that's definitely a, one of the stronger arguments. What about in terms of amount of time? So you're right, but also look at the scope of time. Whereas, exactly. So the argument is that the New Deal was an evolution of the economy. Well, I didn't just rapidly change it. This is what was going to happen with the U.S. economy. It was an evolution of the U.S. economy. Whereas revolutions happen quickly. This wasn't a quick change. This was an evolution of the economy, not a revolution. It wasn't a rapid change to the New Deal. This is what our economy was moving towards anyway. So again, he believed that his economy was an evolution, not revolution. Cool. Okay. So... That's that. That brings us to this. You will have an essay, or a DDQ rather. So, if you pass it down, write on me, put your name on it. yet, so it's possible that you guys won't actually have to write this until next week, but we'll see. Uh, I would rather just assign it this weekend, that way it's still fresh and not you writing it next weekend. Uh, but in any case, it doesn't really matter to me. Uh, likely your unit 9 test will also be a take home, just because time-wise, I don't want to spend more time. We're about two days behind right now, um, just with the Mondays off, and so I need to make that time up, and so we're likely going to take a test home on Friday uh, with this essay. Now, your essay question, or your DBQ, is going to be, analyze the responses of FDR's administration to the problems of the Great Depression. How effective were these responses? How did they change the role of the federal government? So again, you guys can write on this if you like. And again, the DBQ is yours. You should write uh, on the question mark. The question is on that first page. Are you guys see the question there on that first page? All right. So. First, I'm going to talk about the responses. Uh, then we're going to talk about if they were good responses, and then we have to talk about if it changed the role of the federal government for the better. Now, I'm going to go ahead and add an extra column there real quick. So, give me a second. The question we have to ask ourselves first is, uh, again, what were the responses? Then we'll talk about if they were effective and how they would change the role of the government. Because there are pretty much three things that they're asking here. So we have to talk about how FDR responded to the Great Depression first. Now, is there a good way to kind of break down how FDR responded to the challenges of the New Deal? Is there a way to kind of organize those all those groups or all those agencies? Well, we're organize it by acronym, like alphabetically? Maybe we're going to use the agencies, but how can we organize them? Vanessa? Huh? Yeah, I would argue that relief, recovery, and reform is a really good way to break it down. It's actually an excellent answer. I mean, did you just come up with that? It's good. It's a great way. I don't think about it that way. Relief, recovery, reform. You must have a great teacher to break up relief, recovery, reform. 
Again, folks, there is a rhyme and reason why I do the things that I do. It's for things like this. If you're going to write any essay on the Great Depression on the AP test, should you break it up, relief, recovery, and reform? It doesn't matter what the AP test is on. If it's on the Great Depression, it doesn't matter what the question is. You should still break up your paragraphs, relief, recovery, reform. It's the best way to write this essay, no matter what the question is. Because you saw two other questions to answer, but we'll be able to answer them regardless. So, relief, recovery, reform. First off, you have to write down what some of these agencies were. So I'm going to task you real quick. Go ahead and go through your notes, and we want to list down about four or five agencies or programs for each. So relief, recovery, or reform. Look through your notes real quick. Find me a few agencies for relief, recovery, reform. I'll give you guys about a minute, and then uh, raise your hand, and I'll call on you guys to populate our lists. And again, participate. Don't be that guy that just sits there and just gets everyone else's answers. Okay, participate in the work. So I'll give you about 20 more seconds. Look for a few things, and then uh, figure out where you want me to put them. Lisa, said close up, and I'll go to you first. Okay, we're looking for relief, recovery, and reform. Okay, here we go. Carissa, let's start off with you. Nira, sure. And I imagine we also put NRA though, right? All right, what else? Who else has one? Raise your hand. What other administrations do we have? What else at the back? Yeah, where would you put that? Yes, yeah, so a National Labor Relations Board. What else do we put up there? Julian. Yeah, so where would you put that? Recovery. Emergency Banking Relief Act. What other organizations or administrations or policies can be put on this list here, guys? Zaneri. Hulk, where would you put that? The relief, sure. Uh, Chris. Securities and Exchange Commission. Where would you put that? SEC. Able. Huh? Fira. Fira, where would you put Fira? Relief. Fira, very good. What else? We got tons, guys. What else? What else? Oh, uh, yeah. Henry. Not Henry, Anthony. <laughs> huh? Oh, the TVA. Where would you put TVA? Recovery, sure, TBA. What else? What else? Christine. FDIC, we'll put that in the reform. Siamana. CCC, relief. What else? Just continue out of those, guys. Leslie. Go VPA, sure. Siamana. AA, where'd you put that? Relief. Any others? Your husband? Oh, you <laughs> <laughs> huh? Oh, the Social Security Act. SSA, sure. Any others? Yeah. Huh? Bank holiday, yes, but on a recovery. Any others? Here's the web. Yeah, that's it. Civil Works? Yeah, uh, Civil Works Administration. Look at the BWA there, too. We'll put a uh, FHA here. You can put FLSA here. Okay, good. That's a good list, right? You can add to that list later. So, a uh, lot of things, a lot of things. And here's the notable thing. Uh, you can't just write the acronyms on your test. You actually have to know what these stand for. You go, oh, the CCC and the WPA were great, especially when they were working with the CWA, uh, especially when Hulk uh, began to participate in that organization. And uh, with the AAA around, uh, they worked in conjunction with the NRA and the NARA to uh, help promote the uh, orders of the NORB and the FLSA uh, while also working with the SSA and FDIC. You can't do that. You have to be specific. Now, again, I might expect you to know all 20 of these and put them in your essay. No, I mean, use maybe 4404 for each paragraph, but you should know them. Okay, if you're going to use them, you should be able to define these. Uh, you do need to know, again, unfortunately, most of these for your actual AP test, but they will give you the actual acronym. They will give you what it stands for. They want to be like, what did the AAA do? They'll tell you, but it's good for you to know that this is just what they were called. Just know there are a lot of agencies you have to be aware of. But again, by doing this, this is how we're going to help you write a lot for your essay. You definitely already have tons of facts right here. This is your essay right here. But we just have to do more. Yes, so now we have to get to, was it effective or not effective? So let's populate this list real quick. There are the pros and the cons 
uh, the New Deal. Was it effective? Not effective. Oh, by the way, I know it doesn't say this explicitly, but you should mention the New Deal at some point in your essay. It says, the great, uh, response to the Great Depression was the AAA, WPA, CWA. If I read your entire essay and not once mention the New Deal, that would be kind of odd. So make sure you mention the New Deal at least once. But is it effective or not effective? Just give me uh, two things for this one. How is it not effective? Who can tell me how it was not effective? Okay, who's trying to tell me how this was not effective? Uh, yeah, Ryan. Yeah, raised or doubled national debt. That's not good. Can you just look on that why is it a failure list? What else? Is there any? Yeah. Unsustainable jobs. Pretty good. What about effective? Why was this good though? Why was an effective New Deal? Ah, there's one. Prevented economic collapse. Another uh, thing, Vanessa? Prevented starvation, sure. Hang on, can you get that to this list as well? You guys can add to that list, right? Just go ahead and look at your middle of the approach. Chris is in forward again, so you guys can add to that. And again, what you would do is you would take these arguments and you would just fill them into your three paragraphs, right? So you would say, oh, so the AAA was fantastic because then, uh, you know, by providing jobs to all those workers, it did prevent starvation, therefore showing that the New Deal was effective. However, those jobs were unsustainable and thus doubled the debt. Does that make sense? So you can provide criticisms and support for all the New Deal programs throughout the essay. It doesn't have to be one section or another. You're going to provide those support and criticisms throughout the entire essay. Does that make sense to everyone? Well, we went cool. Okay, last question then. The role of government, okay? Did the, was the change of the government good or bad? What are the arguments for or against this change of the role of government? What are some of the criticisms of the government changing? They said it was what? Yeah, it was creeping socialism. You should use the term creeping socialism. It was too socialistic. That's a good argument. What else is there an argument against the government? Of the government what? What else is that? Huh? Sure. Hmm? Yeah, handouts. Yeah, they don't like that how it became a handout state. They don't like that. Huh? It was wasteful. It became a government of waste. Okay, you can add to that list. This is very similar to the other list, but it still answers a slightly different question. What about good change? Why is the government good? Why might we say, oh, that seems pretty good that the government was doing this at the time? Why might we like the new role of government? What are some things that it did that we liked? Hold on. Yeah, so it's clear. I mean, uh, take care of its people, right? We have to kind of imply these, but it takes care of the people. Because it's no longer what philosophy? It's not laissez-faire. So you might say, oh, it's good that it's not laissez-faire. Well, it's not rugged individualism. Individualism. Any others? That might tell the government was good? Huh? Yeah, it's good. It's not like socialism. No reason. Don't get involved to prevent socialism. I know the idea of curbing trusts or of utility trusts. So again, can you guys add a little more to that one? So you just throw that all into your essay. Now, what were the responses? Were they effective, and how did it change the role of government? Oh, government became a largest employer. You can put that in either one, yeah. That's a good or a bad thing, depending on who you talk to. But yeah, could you guys write this essay? Yeah. Easy, right? What was the response? Was it effective, not effective? How it changed the role of government? You guys can type this essay, right? Pretty simple. Now, yes? No. Always sit on the fence. It's always better to sit on the fence. So again, could you write the essay right now with just these facts? Almost definitely. But this is a document or a DBQ. So you must also include documents. There are currently 10 documents. You have to use seven of them. Use seven documents out of the 10, minimum. 
You should use 7 out of the 10 if you want to get that 7, 8, or 9. So let's go over them real quick. Let's try to get through as many of these as we can. We'll analyze them. That was really like a minute. Uh, what's one of the greatest mysteries of the city where women go when they are out of work and hungry? They are, there are not many women in the bread line. There are no flop houses for women as there are for men, where a bed can be had for a quarter or less. You don't see women lying on the floor of the mission in the free flops. They obviously don't sleep on the newspapers in the park. There is no law, I suppose, against their being in these places, but the fact is they are rarely there. Yet there, are, there must be women, as many women out of jobs in cities and suffering extreme poverty as there are men. What happens to them? So pretty much what's the main idea of this? Or how can you use this document? It's, it's telling us what? What's it telling us? Well, how could you use this document? What facts, what this document tells you can you use? You guys have to learn how to interpret the documents, guys. How can you use this in your essay? This is a good one. Huh? Unemployment for women? <laughs> women. Women are unemployed. So, what can you even say? Uh, women were unemployed. Good. Unemployment for women. Cool. That's what we're looking for this document is saying. So, where could you fit this paragraph in? Which paragraph? One, two, or three? Or relief, recovery, or reform? This is a paragraph about, if this is about unemployment, relief, is it? So women were also unemployed according to document A, and so the CCC was one organization that helped to relieve unemployment. Right? Done. Use document A. That's one document down. Letter to Senator Robert Wagner. Already, it's about the Wagner Act. Everyone sympathetic to the cause of creating more jobs and better wages for labor. You should already know this is a job about pro-labor unions, right? It's the Wagner Act. This is the NLRB. You should know that right away, because the Wagner Act. So better jobs and better labor. So you should be able to use this as something pro labor. So find a place to talk about pro labor. I think that's like paragraph three, right? And how about the National Labor blah 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 look at this. As shown in document B, labor unions were more sympathetic, therefore we passed National Labor Relations Board, blah 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 blah. Can you guys handle this? If you have any questions about the documents, feel free to Talk to me during lunch or during EIT. Uh, I'll let you guys know when this essay is due, but it will likely be due sometime next week. I may just assign it to you over the weekend. We'll see. Otherwise, have a good day, folks.